Hey everyone, Professor Davis here and we are going to dive into reproduction and we're going to focus mostly on this reproduction at the cellular level and focusing on the cell cycle and what we call mitosis in this particular video. So guys, a cell's complete set of DNA is what we would call their genome. In all organisms, no matter what organism we're talking about, has the capability to undergo cellular reproduction. Now, this cellular reproduction is known as asexual reproduction. Okay, so this is where a cell can end up reproducing by itself. Now, the purpose of asexual cellular reproduction is going to vary depending on the organism. So unicellular organisms are going to use their cell division primarily for their population to reproduce their species. Okay, so to make more of themselves in the sense of making a bigger population. However, in multicellular organisms like ourselves, cell division is important for us when we grow and also when we repair, when like tissues get damaged and we need to repair those tissues. And so in this particular picture, we see that in A, reproduction in a unicellular yeast cell, cell is from the idea of creating more population. Whereas when we look at plants and animals, which are multicellular, it's for growth. So, so the picture there is an onion root tip and it's showing how the tip grows. And then also for the idea of repair or what we'd consider regeneration, where we see like for this lizard where it has lost its tail in the past and it grows back. So asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction are a little different. We've talked about these in the past. So let's do a quick comparison of asexual and sexual reproduction. So if you recall, asexual reproduction means there's one parent, they generate the offspring, and these offspring are genetically identical. They're not only genetically identical to each other, but they're also genetically identical to the parent. Sexual reproduction, on the other hand, is when you have two parents. These guys generate an offspring, but the offspring is not genetically identical to the parents. We see that they are going to be unique. So in asexual reproduction, the process is mitosis, and in sexual reproduction, it's going to be meiosis and fertilization, which we're going to talk more about in another video. So Liz, if we look here, we have the parent cell. The parent cell is going to divide into two daughter cells. This is going to be the example that we would see more for asexual reproduction, okay, because we have one parent dividing into two. Those cells, though, are genetic identical to each other and to the parent. So this brings us to some terminology where we look at diploid versus haploid. Now diploid guys is represented by 2N and this is a cell that contains a full set of chromosomes. It has a full set of chromosomes and we represent that with 2N. Haploid cells, on the other hand, they are going to be represented with just the N, and they contain half the number of chromosomes. So guys, if you take 2N and you divide it by 2, the only thing that's left is what we would say is N. Now that N number can change depending on what organism we are looking at. So diploid cells are going to be your stem cells that produce body or somatic cells, and they're going to do this through the process of mitosis. Now, each species has their own defined number, that N. And so for us as humans, man, our 2N is 46 chromosomes. So we should have a full set of 46 that we got 23 from mom and 23 from dad to give us the full 46 chromosomes. All right. And so again, this is where mitosis comes in. The cell started with 2N. It then divides and each resultant cell also has 2N. Okay. So they are identically the same as what they were before. Okay. And so this is what we're looking at for diploid in the sense of mitosis. On the other hand, haploid cells are going to be germ cells. Germ cells are produced, they're going to produce gametes by the process of meiosis. Okay, so meiosis is a different process. Now, germ cells are found in the testes and ovaries. Okay, so we do see that these are going to be found in the sex organs, and they produce gametes. These gametes are egg and sperm. We call those the sex cells. Now, in man, again, N is represented by half. Okay, when we say 2N was 46, N is going to be 23. It's half the chromosomes. Half of 46 is 23. And if we look at this particular example, you have 2N going through the process of meiosis, and when they divide, they have half the number of chromosomes. Now, this process is simplified here in this picture. We will go, like I said, in more detail later. 
So let's do some kind of a little bit of math when we talk about diploid and haploid cells. All right, so here are some basic organisms. We have a garden pea, corn, fruit fly, human, chimpanzee, dog, and cat. And what I've given you here is their body cells. So their body cells are going to have two in, so two we look at this, a full set of chromosomes. They've got the full set as two in, and we wanna then determine what the gametes are gonna have. They're egg and sperm. So this is where you're gonna take half the chromosomes. So if we look here at a garden pea, because it starts out with 14, if we do 14 divided by two, you get seven, okay? So the egg and sperm of a garden pea plant are gonna have seven chromosomes. Corn, on the other hand, it's in number. When we look at this, the two in number is gonna be 20. And so what we need to do is divide that by two to get the in number being 10. Okay, a fruit fly has eight full set of chromosomes. Again, if we take half of that, they have four. We've already talked about humans having 46, which means our gametes will have 23. Chimpanzees have 48. So if we divide it by two, they have 24. Dogs have 78 chromosomes. Now, guys, if you look at this, this is why you have such a wide range of dogs from like Great Danes all the way down to Chihuahuas. It has to do with the huge amount of chromosomes that they contain. But if we do 78 being the two in, in is going to be 39. It's half. And a cat has 38 chromosomes. If we divide that again by the two to get the in, they have 19. Okay, so this is where we look at the body cells versus the gametes. Now guys, an observation here is if you notice, all of the body cells are gonna be even. We have to be able to divide them by two. Okay, you can end up having half a chromosome or part of a chromosome, at least you're not supposed to. There's a problem if you do. And so because of this, we do see that they are gonna only be even numbers. However, the gametes can be odd or even. It does not matter because you're gonna multiply by two in that case when you go back to the two in number. So this brings me to an example here of when the chromosomes don't quite add up. So if we take a male donkey and we are going to cross it with a female horse, what you end up with is the hybrid that we call a mule. Now here's where the issue comes in. Donkeys have 62 chromosomes. Okay, so if we look here, 2N is 62 in a donkey, which means the haploid number is 31. And a horse has 64 chromosomes. And so its haploid number is 32. So when these combine, what happens? So what's the mule diploid number? Well, technically it's 63, all right? Because you're gonna do 31 plus 32 because that's the gametes, right? So 31 plus 32 is 63. Well, this creates a problem because now our diploid number is not even. It cannot be divided by two easily. If you divide it by two, we see that you end up getting 31.5. 31.5, you can't have half a chromosome. And so this is why hybrids are typically sterile because they cannot produce viable egg and sperm because it does not half properly. All right, so when a male donkey and a female horse are mated, the result is a is it what we call a mule, it's the hybrid. However, if it's a female donkey that's mated with a male horse, it is actually called a henny. All right, so this brings us to some definitions of chromosomes, okay? So DNA type terms. So guys, chromatin is a thin strand or thread of DNA. It is invisible under the microscope because it is so thin, it's not condensed to where we can see it very well. Even under the microscope, it's very difficult to see. However, chromosomes do condense. When chromatin condenses and coils around these proteins that we call histone proteins, they're actually visible. We can see them underneath the microscope. Okay, so when they're condensed, coiled around those histone proteins, we do see that we can see it better. Now, chromatids are a little different. These are when the chromosome becomes replicated. We've copied it. And so there are actually two of them connected together by a center area called the centromere. Now, guys, if you break that word apart, centro means center, mere means part. So it's just telling you it's the center part between these replicated chromosomes. Each of these is known as a chromatid, and a lot of times when they are connected together like this, we call them sister chromatids. Okay, so collectively they are known as sister chromatids if the two are connected. So guys, if we take a picture here, this is what you're looking at underneath the microscope and you can see the chromatin, you can't really see it distinctly. It's in the nucleus and you can tell there's something in that nucleus, but you can't see them individually. However, if you notice in the second picture, those chromatin has wrapped around those proteins and they're becoming visible in thick type strands. Those are what we would call chromosomes. 
All right, so now let's talk a little bit about some terms with mitosis and cytokinesis that we're gonna be looking at in this video. So guys, the term mitosis actually means nuclear division. And so this is where a cell actually divides its nucleus. It's gonna divide its DNA up. Okay, that's what mitosis technically means. However, we don't just need one cell with two nuclei. We want the cell to also divide. So cytokinesis is where the cytoplasm actually divides into two. Okay, so we do see that mitosis and cytokinesis are going to go hand in hand together in this process that we're going to talk about. So cell division involves the following events. For one, we need the initiation of cell division to happen due to chemical signals. There's got to be some chemical signals that tell the cell that it is time to divide, that it needs to go through this process. Before it can go through this process, DNA needs to be replicated. We need to copy the DNA. That way we get those sister chromatids and each new cell has the exact amount of DNA that it needs. So remember, it's supposed to be identical to each other as well as the parent. We see that mitosis is that nuclear division. It will evenly distribute the DNA into each nuclei. Okay, so we're going to make sure that each nuclei has the right number of DNA. And we also see then cytokinesis follows this process where we actually divide the cell and the cytoplasm. Okay, and so we're actually going to see that cytokinesis happens after that division. Now, guys, this process is known as what we call the cell cycle. Now, the cell cycle takes place in kind of four main stages. Now, if we look at this, there's a, what we call a G1 stage. You can see it here in the pie chart. It's this kind of big piece of pie that says G1 or growth. In this particular phase, organelles are going to replicate and the cell grows in size. That's its name. Now, sometimes, guys, the G phase is known as the gap phase. We then see this is followed by the next piece of the pie, which is called the synthesis phase or the S phase. This phase is where DNA is going to be synthesized or replicated. Because remember, we need to make sure that each new cell has the same amount. And so for us, okay, when we talk about humans, our cells are supposed to have 46 chromosomes. So when we are going to get ready to divide those cells into two and each cell needs to also have 46 chromosomes, I have to copy those 46 chromosomes. And so during this S phase, when those are copied at the end of that, that cell doesn't technically have 46 chromosomes anymore. It has 92 right before it gets ready to divide into two separate cells. So this is the S phase. Then we have a G2 phase. In the G2 phase, this is going to be where protein synthesis occurs, and it's the final growth preparations before they actually divide. So the cell is preparing for this division that it's about to do, and we're double checking all of the work and making sure the cell is ready to go to this next step. The next stage is the M phase, and when we look at the M phase, guys, this stands for mitosis. Now, this is where the nucleus is going to divide, followed by, again, the division of the cytoplasm that we call cytoplasm cytokinesis. Now, nuclear division does happen in some subphases, and we are going to represent these with PMAT. So if you can remember PMAT, it's going to be helpful. P stands for prophase, M is metaphase, A is anaphase, and T is telophase. And so that's where PMAT comes into play. Now, guys, this whole process of G1, S, and G2 collectively is known as interphase. And you can see how it kind of encompasses those three parts of the pie with interphase. And this is where majority of the cell's time is spent. On the other hand, this other piece of the pie that we call mitosis or the M phase is going to be that actual division of the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Now, Importance here for asexual cellular reproduction is that it produces genetically identical cells. This ensures genetic stability. So we want to make sure that the cell, if it started with 2N, it ends with 2N. If it started with N, it ends with N. We want to make sure that they are genetically identical and they are the same as the parent that they came from. And the purpose here, guys, is for unicellular organisms, it, the whole point is so that they can populate an area. So one cell goes to two, two cells go to four, four go to eight, eight go to 16, and so on until they populate the area. However, again, in multicellular organisms, this serves as growth and repair for us, as well as specialization. So when this group of cells come together and they get a job, they become your heart. And this group over here came together and they became your liver. They were then specialized and given a job. 
Now, there are some exceptions to this. Um, when we talk about multicellular organisms, there are some multicellular organisms that actually can reproduce um, and create a whole new offspring through this process. Now, it does not happen very often, but that's where this does occur. So in New Mexico here, where, where we are from or where I'm from, we actually have these little lizards and they're running around like crazy right now. And they're called whiptail lizards and they are all female. They're all female. And so when they reproduce and they lay eggs, those actual lizards that came from that female are going to be genetically the same as their mother. Because no males came into place and no sexual reproduction took place. And so they create more of themselves by laying eggs that are genetically the same as them. And the same thing with Komodo dragons. They do have the ability to do this. Now, it doesn't mean they will all the time. They will look for a mate, but they do have the ability to lay an egg. And then that new Komodo dragon is technically the same as the one it came from. Cape honeybees also do this, some snails and bottlehead sharks. Okay, so these are just some examples. Now, of course, if they have the ability, now whiptail lizards are a little different, but if a male is present, sexual reproduction can occur, that's going to actually help their species and cause some genetic uh, variability, some differences. However, if there's no male around, they can go ahead and reproduce and keep their generational line going. The problem is, is it keeps it stable, but it does not allow for genetic variation. And that genetic variation is important for survival. All right. So this is an onion root tip. Okay. When we look at this and we do see that they're immature cells, they're going through the process of dividing. So they're actively dividing in order for this onion root tip to grow. And again, this is through the process of mitosis. Now, if we look at this, okay, when we're looking at these cells, they've been blown up and you're looking at them underneath the microscope. And this is what we look at for the cell cycle. I want you to hypothesize which part of the cell cycle the majority of the cells are going to be in. Are most of the cells going to be in interphase? So some part of interphase, whether it's G1S or G2. Or are most of the cells going to actually be in mitosis, the M phase where they're dividing? Well, guys, if you look at this pie chart, there's four pieces to the pie and three of the pieces fit into interphase. This means the cell is going to spend most of its time in interphase. So interphase is where they're going to spend most of their time. Now, that doesn't mean some of the cells aren't going through the actual process of mitosis. They are, but most of the cells are going to be found in interphase because it's the longest period of time on this cell cycle. So guys, this whole idea of going through G1, S, G2, and mitosis in animal cells or mammalian cells like ourselves, they complete this cycle about every 24 hours. So if you get a cut, okay, whether it's a paper cut or you cut your finger while you're cooking or whatever, that cut, those cells, they're going to start to repair that cut. And every 24 hours, a cell is going to divide until that cut is healed. Because this is why it takes several days, even if it's a minor injury, for it to heal completely. Because those cells have to go through this process. Okay? And it takes 24 hours at least for them to do this. However, if we're talking about certain bacteria, especially the example I give here is E. coli, it only takes 15 to 20 minutes for them to go through this whole process. Your one cell, it takes 24 hours. Their one cell, it takes 10 to, or 15 to 20 minutes. This means that in an hour, let's just say in an hour period of time, okay? And let's go to the high end, 20 minutes, 20, 40, 60. It's going to replicate three times in just one hour. So we're going to end up going from one cell to two from two to four in one hour time. Is this is why when you're exposed to bacteria and it makes you sick, it can make you sick relatively quickly. Within 24 hours after being exposed, you're sick. It's because those cells can reproduce a whole lot faster than ours can. All right, because they're able to do this process every 15 to 20 minutes and it takes our cells 24 hours to do this. All right, so some interesting facts here. Um, if you'll notice on this particular pie graph, there's like a little extension that comes off and this is known as the GO phase or the G0 phase. This is a substage of the G1 and this is where the cells decide that they're not going to go ahead and proceed with um, replication. 
They're not going to actually divide. And so because of this, they go into a GO phase where they just kind of grow and just do their normal everyday activities. So they do normal function. Now, some cells will continually enter the cell cycle and they never enter this GO phase. They never get there. And these cells, especially like in us and animals or like our epithelial cells, like your skin cells, those slough off and you leave them everywhere you go. And as they slough off, you want them to be replaced so that you continually have skin. And so epithelial cells will do this. Embryonic cells do this in order to create new um, cells to become your heart and your liver and your brain and your kidneys, okay, during that early stage. You also have adult stem cells that are found in your bone marrow that are constantly doing this and dividing. And then cancer cells do this. Okay, so all the rest of these are good examples of when this happens, but cancer cells are the bad ones. They continually divide, and this is why they can cause tumors really quickly. Okay, now when we look at the embryonic cells and the stem cells, they're relatively non-specialized cells, and their whole job is just to divide so that some of those others can mature and to become specialized cells. Now, some cells will enter into the cell cycle only when needed. So the cell will actually go into the geo phase until it's needed to actually divide. And the best example for us in humans is our liver cells. Your liver is the one organ that you can do a live transplant with and it will grow back. Okay, now you can give your kidneys and a live, you can give a kidney and a live transplant as well. But when you decide to donate that kidney, you go from having two kidneys to just one kidney. It's not going to grow back. You went from two to one. But your liver, on the other hand, is different. If you're healthy and your liver was healthy, they can actually cut your liver in half. They can give half of it to somebody else. And within a year, your liver will be grown back into its normal size. And that other piece could also, if that person stays healthy, could grow into a whole new liver. And it's the only organ in the human body that can do this. Now, on the other hand, some cells, once they leave this cell cycle where they're dividing and they go into that geo phase, they never can come back into the cell cycle. And this is true for your nerve cells and your muscle cells. Guys, this is why brain damage in the sense of cells being damaged is so severe or so um, detrimental is because they don't, re they can't be replaced. They can't repair themselves and replace them. And so because of that, it's just lost. Now, it doesn't mean the activity that those cells did do is lost forever because sometimes our brain can route around the damage and you don't have much of an issue, but it does take time. All right. And so nerve cells and muscle cells are an example that once they go into the geo phase, they do not come out of it. All right, so now let's talk about the mitosis itself. Let's talk about this idea of when the cell is actually going to divide because G1, S, G2, they're preparing to divide. They're going through that process of getting ready, but mitosis is when we actually see the division take place. So mitosis begins after interphase is complete. The cell went through G1, S, and G2. And because of this, the important part that it happens after all three of those steps is because remember in the S phase, that's when the chromosomes are being replicated. Okay, so you see in my picture right here, I started with four chromosomes. You have four different ones in different colors. They have been replicated. So now you have two of each. Okay, so they have been replicated through that process. Now, when we look at this too, you'll see that at the top there, those little centriol areas have also been replicated. So let's talk about each of the subphases of mitosis. This includes prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So prophase, what happens during prophase? Well, first of all, the chromatin is going to condense into those chromosomes. They wrap around those proteins and we can actually see them present here. The nucleolus, which is found inside the nucleus, is going to disappear. Now, it doesn't disappear forever, but it's going to go away for a time. And the reason being is that the nuclear envelope that surrounds the nucleus is also going to fragment. We're going to break this apart. This way, the chromosomes have the freedom to move, and we can pull them apart a little bit later. We also see that those centrioles are going to migrate to opposite poles. Now, this is only in animals. Centrioles are only found in animal cells. This does not occur in plant cells. Okay. Now we also see those little lines that are forming. Those are called the spindle fibers. So the spindle fiber formation is going to begin here. 
Okay, so we're starting the process. We're getting rid of the nucleus, we're getting those chromosomes ready to get into place, and we're putting everything together so that we can divide the cell. Okay, so prophase. In metaphase, these duplicated chromosomes, those sister chromatids we've been talking about, they align at the center of the cell. This is known as the metaphase plate or the equator of the cell. This is also when the spindle fiber formation is complete. So you see all those little lines coming in? They're complete because they're connecting to an actual chromosome. And we call that the kinetochores. They're connecting in. Kind of think about it as like when you go rock climbing or things like that and they put you in a harness and they connect the line to you as you repel or you're going to climb up. It's to help hold you in place. The same thing here. They're connecting into those chromosomes so they can get ready to move them. Okay, so we have prophase, metaphase. The next step is anaphase. Anaphase is when the centromeres actually split. That center part between the two chromosomes split so they can move to opposite poles. The single chromosomes then migrate to the opposite polar, opposite side of the cell. And we do see that cytokinesis begins. If you'll notice that the cell has elongated, it's getting longer because we're going to get ready to pinch the middle in and pull it apart to where we have two cells. So we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase. Last step here is telophase. Now guys, telophase is the complete opposite of prophase. So in prophase, we saw that chromosome 10 condensed into chromosomes. Here, chromosomes are going to relax into chromatin. So they're going to relax. The nucleolus is going to reappear. The nuclear envelope is going to rebuild. And we do see that cytokinesis, that pinching off into the two cells of, of separating the cytoplasm, is almost complete. Okay, so this is the opposite of prophase, and we call that telophase. So guys, nuclear division ensures that the equal distribution of chromosomes are going to be in each of the new daughter cells. Okay, so we lined up the four in the middle and we pulled them apart, allowing them to each get the right amount of chromosomes. Because if you'll notice here, these guys all ended with four like the first cell began with. Okay, and so we've got four of each chromosome, we got four chromosomes in each of the cells. Cytokinesis, however, does not ensure equal distribution of organelles or cytoplasm. In this picture, it's showing you that it's pretty much in the middle and it pinches apart, but it could be uneven where one cell is bigger than the other. Okay, so cytokinesis does not mean it's going to be exactly equal in its division of the organelles and the cytoplasm. Cytokinesis is not usually completed until the following interphase begins. So cytokinesis starts and it's almost finished at telophase. However, it completely is finished once the cell enters into the next interphase stage. So in animal cells, guys, cytokinesis is going to happen what we would call through a cleavage furrow. You can see how it's pinching inward and it's creating that cleavage that we would see. However, in plant cells, this has to be done differently because of the cell wall being present. So cytokinesis is going to occur via what we call a cell plate formation. They're going to build a wall in between the two new cells, okay, because they're going to build that cell wall. So plant cells cannot use the cleavage fro because of their rigid cell wall. That is the difference. Okay, their rigid cell wall does not let that occur. All right, so now before we get into what stage is what on this kind of little quiz here, I want to show you something that I like to do with my hands to remember the stages, okay? So interphase, the cell, cell is just doing its normal thing in growth. But in prophase, you will recall that the uh, nucleus disappeared and the chromosomes were, were being visible, okay? So we're going to use our hands here, and this is my cell, and the nucleus has started to disappear, and my fingers that you see here are the condensed chromosomes, Okay, so they're no longer in the nucleus. They're kind of just floating in here. In metaphase, they line up in the middle. Okay, so see all my chromosomes, my fingers are lined up in the middle. In anaphase, they pull apart. And in telophase, they go back into the new nucleus. Now I have two cells. These two cells, the chromosomes are now in the nucleus. And they are smaller than the cell I started with, but they're the same. So we go here. We have prophase, metaphase, anaphase telophase. If that helps, great. If not, you can forget I said it. Okay. 
But now let's take a look at some of these pictures and let's see what phase these are in. Okay, so this is part of that onion root tip we looked at earlier. And we see that there are cells that are undergoing different stages in this. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, and five, and you have your word list here. So if we look at number one, what stage is this one in? Well guys, this is right after division and you can see a cell plate is forming. So this is telophase. So telophase is where we're going to see that that cell plate is forming because these are plant cells because it's an onion, okay? And we do see that their chromosomes are going back into the nucleus. On number two, the chromosomes are being pulled apart like this. And so number two is gonna be anaphase, anaphase. Now, number three is gonna be where your, most of your cells are spending their time. Number three is showing you interphase. Most cells are in that particular stage if you look at this picture. Hey, the, the nucleus is intact, the nucleolus is present. You can see it by a, a darker circle inside of the nucleus. They might be going through the process of replicating their DNA, but that's still in that idea of interphase. In number four, you can actually see that the nucleus is disappearing. Those chromosomes are starting to condense. And so number four is showing you prophase. And last but not least, when the chromosomes are all lined up in the middle, you can see that those number five is going to be metaphase. Okay, so you can take a look and you can end up seeing these cells in different stages. Okay? Whether they're part of interphase or that PMAT in mitosis where we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, or tel. So are these animal or plant cells? Well, it's an onion. So for one, that's a plant, but we know it's a plant cell because of the rigid cell wall. Another thing is you can see that you have the rectangular shape of the cells, which normally represents a plant cell. All right, so let's do a quick comparison between plant and animal cells with mitosis, okay? So the centrosomes, centrosomes are present in both plants and animals, okay? Centrioles, however, are not. So plants do not have centrioles. Remember, they do not even contain that organelle, so they can't have centrioles, but animal cells do. And we do feel like the difference here is because the plant cell does have actual uh, cell walls for these guys to anchor into versus the animal cell does not. Astro formation does not occur in plant cells. It does occur in animal cells. And this is again where they anchor down and they get ready to pull those chromosomes apart. Spindle fibers are found in both plant and animal cells during mitosis. Cytokinesis does happen in both, but remember cytokinesis in plant cells is due to a cell plate. In animal cells, it's a cleavage furrow. And where it occurs, guys, in plants, you're going to find it on the tips of the roots and the tips of the shoots. So this is where plants grow up against gravity and down into the ground. So their roots grow down and their shoots grow up. In animal cells, you're going to find it in their stem cells or what we would call also their somatic cells, body cells. Now, guys, the centrosomes an area at the polar ends of each cell where spindle fibers do originate. This is where centrioles are located in animal cells. Centrioles are not required, though, for spindle formation. And this is you can see this because plant cells do not have them. And aster and spindle fibers, fibers are made out of microtubules. Okay, so remember microtubules we talked about as being part of the cytoskeleton. They are going to make up these spindle fibers. All right, so let's talk real quick about the cell cycle control in cancer. Um, there are some major critical checkpoints that these cells have to undergo in order to continue through this process of the cell cycle. And they are shown in little stop signs here on this picture. You have the G1, the G2, and the M. And so let's take a quick look here. If we look at the G1 checkpoint, the cell cycle checkpoint here is where the cell enters into GO or if the DNA is damaged and cannot be repaired. We do not let the cell move on because we don't want cells to have lots of damaged DNA or mutated DNA and they keep dividing. So this would stop the cell cycle from occurring. At the G2 checkpoint, this is the mitosis checkpoint where they're going to see if the cell can actually go into mitosis and start dividing. Again, they're going to check the DNA and make sure it's been replicated properly. And if not, we are going to then remove the cell. And the M checkpoint, this is when the spindle fibers have connected to the actual 
um, chromosomes. So we're going to double check those and make sure they're connected properly so that when the chromosomes divide, one goes one way and one goes the other, or at least that's what should happen. And so this is known as the M checkpoint. Now guys, in each of these, G1, G2, and M, if the DNA is, is damaged beyond repair, we cannot fix the DNA, chromosomes are wrong, something's happened to where the cells can no longer be successful and do their normal jobs, we want what we call apoptosis to occur. Apoptosis is a chemical signal which leads to the cell's death. Because the cell is going to cause more damage than good, we want to get rid of it. All right, and so apoptosis is going to be that process, and it is a natural process that does occur. So the process of mitosis and apoptosis are normally occurring throughout our bodies constantly. This is what helps keep the number of cells in your bodies in a check and balance. If this is not happening like it should, we are going to see problems. Okay, so they are part of the normal growth and development of the organism. But failure for the cells to control cell division and they just keep dividing, they don't undergo apoptosis, and we have abnormal growth that occurs, this is what creates what we call tumors. Okay, so this process is known as tumors. Now, there are some important genes and chemical, because this is chemically signaled, that are going to be vital to this process of the cell cycle. So the first one are called proto-oncogenes. These are genes that code for the positive cell cycle regulators. They're the ones that are going to help tell the cell, yes, you need to go ahead and divide or no, you don't. Okay. So they are going to be the ones that are going to help with that. Now, oncogenes on the other hand are when the proto-oncogenes become mutated. This causes the genes of the cell to become cancerous. So they're mutated proto-oncogenes, which then tells the cells to divide uncontrollably. Okay, that's not the proper thing to take place. There's also some tumor suppressor genes that we contain in our cells. These are genes that code for the negative cell cycle regulators. Um, when activated, they stop the cell cycle from undergoing uncontrolled cell division. So again, these are like the stop signs. They say, hey, no, no, no. You're too far damaged. You don't need to keep dividing. You need to go ahead and do apoptosis. But guys, the problem is, is if these guys are the ones who are mutated, they're not going to stop the process. Uh, P53 is one of the genes we've been able to identify that is a tumor suppressor gene that gets mutated. And it's mutated in over half of all the human tumor cells that have been researched, looked at. Okay, so when they take a biopsy and they send it off, this gene tends to be 50% of the time or more what is mutated in that cancer cell. The P53 protein is supposed to play multiple roles in the G1 checkpoint. And so if that protein is no longer available, it's not working properly, cells just blow by that checkpoint and they just keep dividing. And this creates an issue and that's why we get that tumor where cancer then spreads and grows quickly. So what happens with the development of cancer? Guys, a mutation has to occur. This is a permanent change that's taken place in the DNA, and it can occur due to environmental factors. We have actually found that there are what we call carcinogens or things in our environment that mutate our genes. Okay, and they can mutate those tumor suppressor genes or those proto-oncogenes. Um, some of these things are like sunlight because they cause skin cancer, um, smoking, Smoking, vaping, those types of things can cause cancer in the lungs. And so we do know that there are some things that have been identified as what we call carcinogens. Now, when cancer actually develops, this is called carcinogenesis. Genesis, guys, means the beginning. And carcinogen tells you it's the beginning of cancer. This is where normal cells are trans transformed into cancer cells. They're no longer doing their normal job. They are now just cancer cells there to divide and take up space. Now, cancers a lot of times are going to be classified based on their location, all right? If the epithelial tissue is what's involved, a lot of times we call these carcinomas, okay? These are going to be external, internal body coverings and linings. They're known as a carcinoma. So skin cancers are carcinomas. If the cancer involves muscles or connective tissue, such as bone or cartilage, we call them sarcomas. Okay, so if it's a sarcoma, it's involving muscle or connective tissue like bone or cartilage. So like osteosarcoma is a bone cancer. If the cancer is involving the blood, we call it a leukemia. OK, 
Okay, so this is different types of cancer. And this is why they have those different names because it's based on where they originated from. Okay, it's based on where they were, what kind of tissue or cells they came from in the body. So guys, some general characteristics of cancer cells versus normal cells. And we're going to put these into a chart here. And you're going to notice that they're going to be opposites. So we got cancer cells, we got normal cells. So cells differentiated. This means they're different and they have a job. In normal cells, this is true. They each have a job and they're doing their normal functions. So they're functional. In cancer cells, no, they're non-functional. They're just there making more cancer cells. That's their new job. Nuclei. Most cells, normal cells, have one. They're uninucleated, meaning they have one nucleus. Abnormal nuclei are found in cancer cells. Cancer cells can have multiple nuclei and they do not care. They don't care that it's wrong. Undergo apoptosis. Remember, this is the program cell death. Normal cells do this. Cancer cells do not. Contact inhibition. Now, guys, this means that if a cell is in contact with other cells on all sides, it will not grow and replicate anymore because there's no space. This is true for normal cells. They have this contact inhibition, but cancer cells do not. This is why they pile up on each other and they're real disorganized in their growth and they create that tumor, that mass that's present. And then growth patterns. We do see normal cells are very organized in single layers, whereas cancer cells are very disorganized into massive multiple layers. And again, this is where the term mass comes in because it's just a big mass clump of cells that's taking place. All right, so abnormal mass of cells is known as a tumor. Okay, so if you've got abnormal cells that are all contained in that area, it's called a tumor. Now, if this tumor is encapsulated, we a lot of times will see that it's non-cancerous and we call it a benign tumor. It does not invade neighboring tissues. It's encapsulated. It's covered all together. These are a lot of times easier to remove depending on their location, but they are considered non-cancerous tumors. On the other hand, if it's a malignant tumor, it's one that's an invasive cancer tumor. It invades neighboring tissues. This is known as a metastatic tumor. Cancerous tumors, they are going to metastasize, meaning they travel via your bloodstream or your lymph vessels, some sort of fluid through your body to somewhere else. Okay, so this is why like a patient, a lot of times I say, well, I've got breast cancer, but then they'll say, but it spread to my bones. It spread to my liver. It spread to my kidneys. This means it originated in the breast tissue, but then it spread to other areas. It's metastasized. Now, cancerous tumors also are really good at making sure they can do their job. They undergo what we call something called angiogenesis. Now, earlier I said genesis means the beginning. Angio means blood vessels. Guys, this is where cancer cells actually cause blood vessels, new blood vessels to grow in them. And this gives them more food nutrients. It makes them be able to grow faster and the masses can grow a lot quicker. It also makes them harder to remove because now they have an extensive blood supply and removing them could cause a lot of bleeding to take place. Okay, And so this creates, again, more of an issue when it comes to treating cancer. So prognosis, when an individual is diagnosed with cancer, what is their prognosis? What are the chances they're going to survive? Well, a lot of times they are given some sort of stage. If you've heard, oh, they have stage one cancer or they have stage four cancer. These stages come about based on some of the following questions. For one, is the cancer metastasized, like moved to other areas or is it localized? If it's more localized, that's an early stage cancer that we would call more of a stage one, stage two. If it's metastasized and it's spread out through the body, that's more of stage three, stage four. Another thing we have to look at are lymph nodes involved. Lymph nodes, guys, are going to be these structures who are supposed to help monitor and kill invaders, things like that. But they do sometimes get used as a highway for cancer cells to travel. And if that's the case and lots of lymph nodes are involved, that's a higher stage cancer. This is why a lot of times people who have had like uh, breast cancer and they get a mastectomy and they remove the breast tissue, they'll also remove the lymph nodes in those areas because we're trying to prevent those cancer cells from spreading to other places. And if it has spread, what extent? What's the extent of it, of it metastasizing? Has it gone to lots of areas? Has it gone to just one area? Those are things we would have to look at. So prevention. 
because we know some things cause cancer, we do know that we could help try to prevent cancer in some ways as well. So these are some things that you could be proactive in doing. All right, now, genetically, you might be more prone to some of this cancer and you can't change your genetics. But there are some things that we could do to help. So one is having a good diet. One way to do this, increase your consumption of vitamins A and C. This means eat things like carrots, fruits, dark green, leafy vegetables. Maintain a healthy body weight. Um, colon cancer, or sorry, colon cancer, breast cancer, and uterine cancers are 55 times greater among obese women. So women who are obese have a 55% greater chance of developing these three types of cancers. Whereas in males, colon cancer is a 33% greater chance among obese men. Okay, and this doesn't mean you for sure gonna get it if you're overweight, but being overweight increases your risk of certain types of cancer. Um, avoid certain carcinogens that we know of. Carcinogens that we know can cause cancer, stay away from them. Like the sun, you can't stay away from it completely, but use sunscreen. Avoid tobacco products. Okay, there are certain things we know cause cancer, we should try to avoid them. Limit your alcohol consumption. Now you'll notice it doesn't say get rid of it or stop it, but you should limit it. Okay, the more you drink, the more it causes damage to your liver, which then can cause types of liver cancers. And so again, avoiding or limiting alcohol consumption. Also getting cancer screenings. Early detection is key. If we can detect it early and we can get it in stage one, it's a whole lot easier to treat than if it's in stage three or four. In some cases in stage four cancer, there's not anything we can do. All right, so early screening, and this is like things like pap smears, um, mammograms, colonoscopies, those types of screenings are gonna help potentially ca catch those cancer issues earlier rather than later, okay? So far, guys, we've been talking about mitosis, which mitosis means nuclear division. So this means we've been talking about division of eukaryotic cells, cells that have a nucleus. But what about those cells like bacteria that have are prokaryotic? They don't contain that DNA. And we talked about the, how the purpose of them is to go from one to two, two to four, and so on in order for them to populate an area. Well, they're going to do asexual reproduction by the process called binary fission. Okay, binary means bi means two, so we're going to divide into two, and fission means to break apart. Okay, so this is where, again, the daughter cells are genetically, genetically identical to the parent. So parent to daughter, they're all exactly the same. Now, they're going to do this through that idea of binary fission, and we have some steps as well. Okay, no nucleus is involved here though. So first, the circular prokaryotic chromosome has to be replicated. So they have one circular chromosome, it needs to replicate into two. So they are going to copy it. Once they've copied this, you're gonna see that the cell's gonna start to elongate. It's gonna start to get longer. These duplicated chromosomes tend to attach to opposite ends of the cell, like you see here, that kind of like, look at that red region, it's like attached to the cell. And as the cell elongates and starts to pinch to make two cells, each circular chromosome is in a different portion of that. Formation of a septum divides the actual cell into two, so the plasma membrane and cell wall form in between them. So guys, it's almost like a combination of the cell plate and cleavage furrow. They almost use both because you'll notice it pinches in towards there and then they build a, a septum between the two. Eventually though, they do divide into two separate cells. These are going to be identical cells that are formed. And this is that process of binary fission. It's a little simpler because there's no nucleus involved and they also only have one chromosome versus like for us where there's 46. Okay, and so the process is similar, but it is less complicated. All right, so this finishes up looking at mostly asexual reproduction through mitosis or binary fission. We will dive into more of sexual reproduction in our next video. If you have any questions or concerns though, please let me know. Mm -hmm.